My daughter, Stephanie, lives down in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, something amazing has happened in her life. She's turned into a sports fan. I mean, this year, she's gone to a hockey game, a baseball game, um, a football game, and now she is she's just a rabid Phoenix Suns basketball fan. Uh, they don't have cable TV, but she went out and bought a service that allows them to get TNT so they can watch the NBA playoffs. Now, this is amazing because I never got to do anything regarding sports with my daughter all through her childhood. She was a brainiac. She was into violin. Uh, she was into books and that kind of stuff. And now she's a sports fanatic. And um, I'm looking forward to someday sitting down and maybe even going to a game with her. But I do like the NBA playoffs. I don't like the NBA season, but I like the playoffs. And especially like this year because there's two teams, one in each conference, who um, was stacked with superstars. I mean, they paid mega millions of dollars to build these, these superstar teams, and neither one is in the playoffs right now. <laughs> the ones in the playoffs are these teams that have, have some good players, but a lot, of, a lot of average players and a lot of players that you don't even know who are working together in beautiful harmony and symmetry, and they just know how to function as a team, and they're doing phenomenally well. It reminds me of that movie, The Bad News Bears, how this motley crew of kids come together and become this, this great baseball team. Well, we as a church are this crew of people uh, with, with varied gifts and, and no superstars, but we just come together, and we are not the bad news bearers. We're the good news bearers. And, and we, we, we take the good news out, the life-changing message of Jesus Christ to others. That's why I'm encouraging you over these last week, this week, and next week to be a part of a church, to actually say, hey, I want to be part of that church. I'm going to be a member of that church. Now, I know membership's kind of out of vogue, but we do a membership class called Welcome to the Family a few times a year. The next one's coming up on May 15th and 22nd. And if, and if you don't have a church home and you're considering this church as your home, I encourage you to come on those two days to be part of that class. It's a two-part class at 11.30 or 11 o'clock on those two Sundays. But churches have fallen on hard times, went through COVID. A lot of churches shrunk down. Some even closed their doors. And at the same time, there have been a lot of scandals in the news. It seems like every month there's another pastor of some major church who's now uh, had something come out of their past, or they find out that this, this pastor's been a bully or, or dealt un, unruly with finances or had some sexual thing going on on the side or covered up something. And so all these major players, these superstars, have fallen. And I don't think God needs superstars to build his church. He wants people like you and me to come together because, because we are members of the family of God, members of the body of Christ. And even though there's no membership class in the Bible, membership is a biblical concept. I shared with you the first key word that membership means connecting. Connecting first with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and then connecting with other people within the church family. If you're a part of a family, you connect. You just don't show up at the dinner table. You, you interact with people. You get to know people. You invest in their lives. You help one another. Same thing in the church. We're a family. We're the family of God. We're also a body, the body of Christ. We'll learn today how the body functions as one unit. Now, we have membership in a lot of different places in life, but membership can mean different things. For example, if you're a member of a country club, you pay your dues, and you get perks and privileges. And that's not the church membership. You don't get any perks and privileges and paying your dues at church. What you get is the opportunity, like a health club, if you have a membership in a health club, you go there to exercise. You are part of a church to exercise your faith. Because we come to get, and we also come to give. We come to receive. We come to receive God's uh, blessing. We come to receive encouragement. We come to receive the truth of God's word. But if all we do is receive, if all we do is take in, it's kind of like all you do is eat. You become fat, lazy, and eventually sick. We are meant to exercise. We are meant to take in so that we give out. We are meant not only to connect, but to contribute. And when you're involved in a church, at the heart of that is that every person makes a contribution. Now, I, I define the church like this. The church is a community of believers who have been so radically changed by Jesus that we've devoted our lives to serving others and bringing that same life-altering message to those who haven't heard. We believe that when we combine our wisdom, energy, abilities, and resources and work as a unified team under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, God does amazing things. Amen. I truly believe that. Because no matter what you see happening to churches around the world, Jesus still said, the gates of hell will not stop it. It's an undefeated church. And it is still God's plan to use local churches to do his work in this world. I mean, sometimes you look and think, oh, the church isn't very strong, the church isn't doing its job. But I'll tell you this, if there weren't churches in this world, you would, if you'd look at families and marriages and governments and civilization, we would be way off the rails. 
It's been the church that's helped bring people back, restored marriages, restored families, brought sanity to government, brought equality to people. God is using his church in incredible ways, and I want you to be part of it and experience the joy in being part of his work. Now, you may wonder, Pastor, I I don't know what my part is in that. That's what we're going to talk about today, because there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 12 that I think speaks to every single one of us. Is this verse here, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In other words, God has anointed you through the Holy Spirit in a profound way to make an impact on the lives of others. He's anointed you to positively impact others. All of us, if you're a believer in Jesus, have been anointed to do that. That may be old news to some of you, but for others, it may be new news with, with, with a lot of questions that come with it. And I want to answer some of those questions. First of all, what, what's meant by spiritual gifts? Even though they're not mentioned particularly here, a, a spiritual gift is really what, what's meant by the manifestation of the Spirit. The manifestation of the Spirit, the way the Spirit manifests Himself in your life, one of the ways is through spiritual gifts. It says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. And he manifests himself one way through spiritual gifts. What are spiritual gifts? Well, first of all, they're gifts, which means you can't earn them. You don't deserve them. They're given graciously to you. Now, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you get a whole bunch of gifts. It's like a whole package. Salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit, because he's God, he keeps giving to you. He keeps giving love and joy and hope and courage and peace and self-control. And he gives you these things called spiritual gifts gifts. They are a manifestation of his presence. Now, we don't get to choose our gifts, but we are to eagerly desire them. Eagerly desire spiritual gifts. God wants to give you gifts. And if you're a believer, he's given you gifts. They don't come because you've earned it. They don't come because you know the Bible to a certain degree. It it, it doesn't come to you when you've matured in your faith to a certain level. It's given simply because you're a child of God. God has given you gifts. He determines what gifts are best for you and what's best to work through you. It says, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He wills. Not as we will, as He wills. You may wish you had a great singing voice and God says, ah, no. I'm I'm going to make you a great great worker with preschool kids. So so that may be God's (laughs) gift for you. I'm going to make you a great door greeter. That's what you're really good. I want you to smile a lot, welcome people. That's going to be your gift and your calling. They're called spiritual gifts because they come from the Spirit. They're not spiritual in the common sense of the word. Like like someone was like, "I'm I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, meaning I operate from the heart kind. I'm real deep inside, and I'm not into all the rituals. That's not what's meant here. It means it's it's a gift of the Spirit. It's a representation of the Spirit. So, like I said, it's a manifestation of his presence. Now, if you get a virus, that virus may manifest itself in your body in different ways. Sore throat, runny nose, cough, a rash. That's a manifestation of this invisible virus that's running rampant through your body. Well, the Holy Spirit lives in your body, but you can't see him. How is he going to show himself? How is he going to reveal himself? What are the symptoms that you have of the Holy Spirit? One of them is spiritual gifts. Holy Spirit is not trying to hide from you. He's trying to manifest himself in you. And if you pay attention, he'll help show you how he's gifted you. Now, what kind of gifts does he give? Well, if you read Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, there's lists of gifts there. Some are speaking gifts like exhortation, encouragement, prophecy, teaching. There's service gifts like mercy and hospitality. There's governance gift like gifts like uh, leadership and administration. There's even miraculous gifts that God gives some people, gifts of faith, uh, miracles, uh, the ability to speak unlearned languages. Now, I know some people believe, no, God doesn't do those things uh, anymore. But I have to tell you from my own witness and experience that God God can give any gift he wants to any person he wants at any time he wants. See, God's the one who chooses to give the gifts. And I don't even believe that these lists in the scriptures are the exhaustive list But they're examples of the kind of things God does because cultures change. The needs change in each generation. I mean, technology has created a lot of new kinds of opportunities for gifts that didn't exist in biblical times. If you'd say, like, I've listened to this worship artist and they really minister to my soul when they sing or play. Well, that's true. I've, I've experienced that many times. 
But there's no mention in these lists of the gift of singing or the gift of playing musical instruments. But, but we know that yeah, that's happened. The gift of writing. Some people just, God can really speak through the pen or the typewriter or the keyboard, but that's not listed in Scripture either. So uh, God can give any gift He wants to any person He wants at any time He wants. But how do you distinguish a gift from a talent? Because we may say, well, pastor, I, th- I think I'm good at this thing. Does that mean that's my spiritual gift? Not necessarily. They're talents and they're spiritual gifts. Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes they are very different. Talents are given when you're born. It's, it, a lot of it's genetic or, or the family environment you're part of. You're just born with a propensity or a liking to that thing. And so you grow up and you may be a good athlete or a good musician or you may, you may be good with math because that's how um, God wired you. Michael Phelps, um, he, he's an Olympic swimmer, he's won 23 gold medals. Michael Phelps has a unique body where his arm, when they're stretched out, are, is, is longer than his body. Usually it's about the same. It's, a, it's a several inches longer. He's got, he's got like wings, which help him to swim. And then he's got these shoulders that actually bend in ways that other people's arms don't bend. And so he's a phenomenal swimmer. You see families of sports athletes, um, the McCaffrey family. Uh, the Watts family. Right now in baseball, there's a lot of juniors out there who've grown up in family environments that have nurtured certain talents. So we have talents. They're God-given, and they're given when you're born. They have to be developed. But then spiritual gifts are given when you're born again. When you're born again. It's something that sometimes can look very different. There's nothing wrong with talent. We like talented people. I like watching talented actors. I like I like talented doctors, right? It's talented surgeons, ta- talented builders, architects, musicians. I mean, we like talented people. I like talented cooks, don't you? Love talented cooks. May not be a spiritual gift, it's just a talent. It's God given, and you can go- glorify God in your talent. But, but you can also be very selfish with your talent. You can use your talent all about yourself. You can, you can, instead of glorifying God with your talent, you can use it about you. Build up your brand name, your name, your business. There are many businesses with talented people like Apple, Amazon, and Disney doing phenomenal jobs. We like their services. We like most of their products. They're very talented. They're not kingdom focused, though. They're not about Jesus. In fact, Disney's more about the magic kingdom than Jesus' kingdom. We as a church use what God has given us for God's kingdom. Now, Moses, when he was building the tabernacle, needed some talented people to help. It says, Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him up to come and do the work. You, know, you want talented people doing things. But like I said, talent can go to your head. It can be a very, very proudful to use your talent. It can be very self-serving. You can even become lazy with your talent, feeling like, I don't have to work at this because it comes so naturally to me. That's not a good use of talent. But talent uh, can blend into or be supercharged by your spiritual gift. They can be very different things. Now, who gets them? Every believer gets them. Every believer. Again, Paul said, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Who? To each. To each what? Each believer. Each follower of Jesus. So there's a problem in that so many Christians don't know their spiritual gift, which is such a shame because, like I said, the Holy Spirit's trying to manifest in your life. It's not like he's trying to play hide and seek with you. And I believe if we would just cooperate with him and pay attention to him, he would say, I'm trying to show you what your spiritual gift is. See, we struggle with talents on the one hand. We have kids that go through 12 years of school. In fact, many kids, I don't know if there's some here, you're going to graduate. And I think it's such a shame that a child can go through 12 years of school and get to the point of graduation and have no clue what to do with their life. And so, so they say, well, I'll go to college because maybe I can figure it out when I go to college. And they go to college, and similar to school, they have a set curriculum. It's kind of cookie cutter for, for a lot of people to go through when you get to the end of it. And so we have, we have kids that are coming out of college with degrees they never use and who work at Taco Bell and Chick-fil-A. Nothing against those companies, but they, they don't use, they still don't know what they're made for. And if we as believers are tuning into God, God says, I made you special. I want to work through you in a powerful way. Pay attention to me, and I'll help you to find that out. See, we're all like parts of the body. 
It says, for, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, that would look weird, where would the sense of hearing if the whole body were near, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. We are parts. You know, body has many, many parts. We, we grow, grew up in school learning the parts of the body. You know, there's the arms, the legs, the ears, the nose, the knee, the foot, the toe. And you say, like, which one's most important? Well, when it's not working at the moment, that's the one that's the most important. You know, if it's your thumb that's hurting right now, that's a very important part of your body. When the eye's not working, well, that's a really important part of your body. When your nose is congested, that's a really important part of the body. And, and you are made different than other people. You have a specific place to play in the, in the body of Christ. Some are very visible. Some get more attention than others. But they're all important. I get to be in a very visible role. So does it, says Matt and Colton and, and the worship team. They're, they're up on stage. But we couldn't do what we do without the many, many people behind the scenes, running slides, managing the sound, preparing things for the service, printing the bulletin, doing all the things. You don't even know their names sometimes, yet they're so important. Let me, let me, let me ask you this. If there's a guy on a SEAL team who jumps from, air, jumps from helicopters or airplanes and skydives into danger zones, he's a pretty important guy, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. You know who else is important? The man or woman who packs the parachute. Okay, is that, person, is that person very important? You have no clue who that is? You want to make sure that they are good and do that job well. We want people who do every job well. You want the foot to work well, the hands to work well, the ears to work well. When all that's working well, man, it's beautiful. And here's what happens is, is when you're functioning in the way God has designed you, there's joy. There's joy. There's incredible joy. And there's purpose. Like, I feel like I matter now. I feel like I have a role to play. And you know what's beautiful is if somehow you land a job where actually your job enables you to do your spiritual gift. You know, I get to do that in ministry most of the time is I get to do uh, spiritual things. But there's other people who says, you know what, I've got a job. I use my talent for my job. So it provides well for my family, meets our needs, but it also gives me time then to invest as a volunteer in my spiritual gift. When I was at a church in Arizona, we had a man who's, who was an, uh, later an elder. His name was Don. Don was a fantastic sign painter. He could take a, 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 a fine uh, paintbrush and paint uh, script letters on a sign that looked like they were printed with a computer. I mean, just very beautiful, very, very beautiful eye, wonderful signs. And when he would be asked, like, hey, Don, what do you do for a living? He says, I'm an evangelist for Jesus Christ, and I support my ministry by painting signs. What a way to look at your life. This is, this is my ministry. This is my purpose and calling, and here's how I support it. And many of you are in the same boat. Yes, you have a job, and you don't feel that job is really God-glorifying like you'd want it to be. That's okay. You're using your talent to provide for your family needs as God's opened that door. But God also says, okay, now let's use your spiritual gift. Let's use the way, the way I gifted you to really make an impact in someone else's lives. Now, how do you discover that? How do you find that out? Well, first of all, uh, I would say start to dabble with things. If you'd have no clue, just start, start, start to offer yourself to serve in the opportunities that God opens the door to. Because here's what I found in my life. When you start trying different things, all of a sudden you say, you know what, that was okay and that was okay. I really liked that one. I really liked when I did that. And here's how you can tell you're in the area of your, your giftedness, that sweet spot. You not only have a joy in doing it, but other people have a joy in you doing it. Both of those. Because sometimes you may enjoy doing it and nobody else enjoys you doing it. You, know, you think you're a great singer and you love it and someone says, uh-uh, no. See, if, if, you, if you enjoy it and nobody else does, let's just call it a hobby, okay? <laughs> but if you do it and others are blessed by it, then it's ministry. It's ministry. Then once you discover it, develop it. Develop it. They don't, gifts do not come all put together. It's like God gives us this gift and says, okay, it's yours to start to shape and mold and grow. Just like talents. You've got to practice. You've got to study. You've got to 
do trial and error. You've got to get out there and do things with it. And over the course of time, you get better and better. You know, I knew when I was young, a young Christian, that, that I probably had a gift of teaching. That was, I, I looked at the Bible in a way where I'm looking at it for how it benefits me, but I can't help but think how I can translate it to help other people. And I've always thought like in two tracks, and I say, oh, God, that must be because you want me to teach, and you've given me a desire to do that, and a mind to think that way. But then, you know, in recent years, some people in this church who've kind of walked the journey here at Pikes Peak for a couple decades have said, Pastor, you know, you teach a lot better now than you used to. And I thought, do I take that as a compliment? <laughs> or, because it feels kind of hurtful, like you didn't like me back then? It's like telling someone, like, you look really handsome now. <laughs> now? What did you think of me before? But, but you know what? If we can get over the, pa- the, the fact that, yeah, we probably weren't all we thought we were back then, but we're not who we were. We're better now. That's the important part. We've grown. We've gotten better. There's always room for, for improvement. It's always good to get feedback from others because you want to continue to know that God is using you. And then once you have discovered them and developed them, deploy them, use them. Don't, don't wait until you're perfect. Don't wait until you're better than everybody else. See, I think, I think here's one of our greatest fears. I, I, I'm not sure if I have the gift because there's someone better than me. I don't know if I, I have the gift because I'm not good enough with it yet. I mean, I think that's a lie of Satan because if you're a parent, which of you would say to your child who says, um, Mommy, I want to be a singer. And, and would you say to her, hey, honey, I know you like to sing, but you're no Adele. <laughs> Give it up. Give it up. Or, or says, son says, hey, dad, I think I, want to, I think I want to play basketball when I get bigger. says, you're no LeBron James. You know, son, there's no future in it for you. Now that, that, that's devastating. Why do we do it to ourselves then? Why do we say when God starts to move in us to to give us a desire to say, yeah, but I'm not as good as that person. I'm not as good as that person. I mean, you know, if I had to say, uh, look at other pastors and go, oh, yeah, there's a zillion pastors better than me that can preach. Andy Stanley and Joel Osteen and, you know, all the, there's a zillion of them out there. The goal isn't to be better than them. The goal is to be the best version of me. And your goal is to be the best version of you. Be the best that you can be. Yesterday, the NFL concluded their their draft for this year. And they got all these athletes who have dreamt someday of playing in the NFL. And, a lot, and, and most of them didn't get drafted. Now there's other ways you can get in. You can be a walk-on. But most of them are just going to go back. They're going to find some other career. But those who did may have a career. In fact, there was a, a draft pick in the year 2000. He was a 199th pick in the draft. He was a quarterback. Uh, people didn't highly regard him, but a team picked him up as a backup on their team. And this quarterback just worked hard behind the scenes. And a couple years later, got an opportunity to enter the game and started to prove that he could do what they needed done. And over the course of his career, which then is still going on today, he has won seven Super Bowls more than anybody else. Tom Brady. Tom Brady. You know, if he would have said, you know, I'm not as good as all these other guys getting drafted in the first round, he would have quit. But he says, no, I'm going to hang in there. I don't have to be better than them. I just have to be the best version of me. And look where it's taken him. There's another question we ask with gifts, okay? If they're, if these spiritual gifts are for everyone, what are they for? And Paul says very clearly what they're for. They're, for, they're, they're to impact other people. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Get this, for the common good. The common good. In other words, this gift really isn't for you. This gift is given to you to give to others. That's important. If we think this spiritual gift is for me to hold on to and for me just to feel good about, we've missed it. It is a gift that I I take joy in passing on to others. Peter says this, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. When we are saved, we're saved by what? Grace. We're saved by grace. God's free gift to us changes our lives. But after we're saved by grace, the grace continues to flow into our lives. What do we do with it? We serve. We serve God. We give God's grace to other people. We're saved by grace. We serve by grace. That's why our vision as a church, we changed this last year to this, to this statement. Our vision at Pikes Peak Christian Church is to transform broken people into relentless loving servants of Jesus Christ because we are saved to serve. And I have to tell you, when I was saved, it was a tearful, joyful experience. But you know what surpassed that joy? The joy 
in being used by God to bless other people. I mean, I have to tell you, and if you've never experienced this, you don't know what you're missing. There is a joy unspeakable when, when you feel like God has used your life to make an impact on somebody else's life. When someone says, you know, that thing you did for me, you know, you came and prayed for me or, or that teaching you gave to me or your counsel for me or whatever it is that you helped that person in. When that person comes to you and says, that, that, that made a difference in my life. I mean, you start thinking like, my life counts for something. I, I made a difference in somebody's life. Yesterday, I got to come here to church because a dad and a nine-year-old boy uh, wanted me to baptize them. And so we came here Saturday. That water, by the way, is pretty cold right now. We got in that cold baptistry, baptized dad, and he gave me his big bear hug, and then baptized his little son, Jedediah. He gave me a hug. And then when we walked back there, a little boy sat down on a chair and said, is it okay if I pray? I said, no, we don't do that here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to have you pray. So we just paused, and this little boy bent over like this, and he said a prayer kind of like this. Dear Jesus, I want to live my life for you. Thank you for dying for me and help me to follow you always. Help me with my temper in Jesus' name. And I thought, man, what a... And he's nine years old, nine years old. You know what happens when you reach a nine-year-old for Christ? He's got all these years to live for Jesus. He's going to go through middle school and high school knowing that Jesus is with them always. He's going to face those temptations and go, you know what? Jesus, help me with this thing. He's going to go get out of high school and, and feel his call in his life to be used in some way by God. I mean, what a great opportunity when you pour your life. I just want to applaud you who work with our kids and students because you're getting them at a time, it's like when they're wet cement and you're helping to form that cement so when it solidifies, they know they are solid. They, they have a concrete identity in Christ. What a great opportunity you have. There's, I don't think there's anything more important in a church than investing in our young people. And so for me, when I went home yesterday, yes, was it an inconvenience on a Saturday? Yeah. But that's why we do ministry. It's, it's not an inconvenience when you get to be a blessing. And, and you're missing out on that if you're not being used by God. You're not only missing out on it, but when you don't fulfill your role in the body of Christ, other people miss out on it too. Do you realize that when you say no to your gift, that someone else is negatively impacted? I mean, I think back to the story of, of Moses. When God heard the cries of his people, they were in Egypt in bondage, and they cried out, God, help us, God, save us, God, deliver us. And God said, okay, finally, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to pick that guy, Moses, to be the man who will deliver them. And so there's this burning bush incident where God meets Moses, and he calls him, and he says, I want to use you to go and free my people from the hand of Pharaoh. And, and Moses you think Moses would go, wow, me, oh, I can't believe it. Of all the people you chose me, Moses are saying, ah, uh, I don't know if that's a good choice, God. In fact, he comes up with a bunch of excuses. What I find is they're the exact same excuses we use when God says, hey, I've gifted you, provide an opportunity to go to use these gifts, and you, and you are acting like Moses. Because here's what Moses did. See if any of these resonate with you. First, he said, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Ever feel inadequate? Ever feel an opportunity presented to you and you go, who am I? Why, why did you ask me? What, what, what do I bring to the table? God is not looking for people with confidence in their own ability. He's looking for people who have great confidence in him. Him. He's not looking for what you are able to do. He's looking for what you're available to do. God wants to use you for his glory. And he chose Moses, not because of who Moses was, but because of what God could do through Moses. God said to him, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Here's the next excuse. Moses comes back. He's, he's not convinced yet. He says, uh, I, don't, I don't know enough. He, and Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Have you ever felt like you were in a place where someone might ask you a question and you'd go like, uh, I don't know. I don't, want, I don't want to go through that feeling. I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want to work with those kids or, or those adults because I don't want to go share my faith with someone because if someone asks me a question that I don't know, 
Oh my goodness, it will feel so embarrassing. And then we say, oh God, you know what else? It looks pretty bad on you too. Because if I look bad, it makes you look bad for calling me to do this thing that I really don't know what to do. So here's what God said to Moses. I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And who knows you? And you may say things like, well, I'm not a Bible scholar, and I'm not the most talented person, and I'm not this, and I'm not that. But every time you say, I am not, God just says, but I am. I am that I am. I'm sufficient. All you need to know is me. I've called you, I'll be with you. But Moses said, people might reject me. People might reject me. Moses said, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. And the Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? He said, a staff. He said, throw it to the ground. He threw it to the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. When you serve the Lord, it's really like you are an instrument in God's hands. You're an instrument that he wants to use for his purpose. And, and when you are an instrument, that means anything that you have can also become his instrument. So for Moses, it was this rod in his hand. He says, Moses, what's in your hand? Let me have it. Let me use it. Same thing he's asking to you. What's in your hand? What do you have? What do you possess? Maybe not physically what's in your hand, but it could be what's in your head. What's in your bank account? What, 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 what do you possess? What is it that you can offer that I can use as my instrument? God wants to use what you'll offer to him. Moses still isn't convinced. He says, God, I'm not skilled. He said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Ever said that to the Lord? God, I'm just not the most talented. I don't have what it takes. And the Lord said, who's made man's mouth? Who's, who's, who? Who can make him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. I love that phrase, I will be with your mouth. Because I know God says I'll be with you, but like I'm going to be with that mouth of yours. And if he can be with your mouth, can he be with your ears? Can he be with your eyes? Can he be with your heart? Can he be with your mind? I think he can be with all of that. What he's saying is, I can use that. If you submit it to me, I can use it. You may not be skilled, but it's not about what you can do. It's what I can do with what you've given to me. So offer it to me. But then Moses got to the last excuse, which really was the bottom line to all of them. It was really, all those others were surface issues. The last one was, I really don't want to do it. He said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Please, Lord. Will you send someone else? That's the real heart of the problem. Moses really didn't want to do it. God, that's the the day the game's on TV. That's not a good day for me. Uh, God, that's a big inconvenience. That's a lot of days of walking in the desert. God, I I don't really want to do that. It's very uncomfortable, God. You know that? Hey, get someone else, please. It's not happening with me. And you'd think that God would say, like, okay, I'll just find someone else. But, but listen, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Why was God so angry? Why is it when Jesus tells a parable of the talents, when one guy gets five and uses them and, he, and he's rewarded with five more, and this one who has two uses them and, God, and Jesus says, and yeah, he got two more, but the guy who had one who buried it, his owner says, throw that guy out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why is it such a serious thing not to do what God's gifted you to do? It's not just because you lose the benefit. It's because the people on the other end don't get the benefit. If Moses would not go to be the deliverer, he was saying, God, I don't like your plan for me, and I actually don't like your plan for your people. They're not worth it. Leave them there. Leave them there, God. This is why God was so angry with Moses. And you see what he's saying to us when he says, I come to live inside of you, to do my work through you. And when you resist it, when you block it, it's not just that you miss out on the blessing, but someone else, that that child who needs you to teach him, that child doesn't get taught. That that elderly woman in the nursing home that needs you to visit them, she never gets visited. The person that needs to come up and pray with you, well, you weren't there, they couldn't pray with you and they couldn't find anyone else to pray with. 
Because you wouldn't faithfully use your gift, the person I wanted to bless was deprived of the blessing. Now you may think, well, God surely will find someone else. I'd like to think that. But if that were true, that would mean ministries everywhere around the country would always stay open and flourish. But sometimes they shut down. Why? Because there's nobody to serve. They close down. Ministries close down. Because there's nobody that wants to do that ministry anymore. This isn't really about Moses. It's really about you and me. And I have to ask you a really, a really big question. Whose future is being impacted by your willingness or unwillingness to do what God has gifted you to do? Whose future is being impacted by your willingness or unwillingness to do what God has called you to do? See, the stakes are really, really high. And, and, and someone, someone may, may ask this question or, or even use this excuse, well, pastor, I would serve, but nobody's ever asked me to serve. Well, that'll end today. <laughs> because I'm going to ask you to serve. It's Serve Sunday. That's why we do these Serve Sundays, to give you opportunities to serve. And we have tables in the foyer with all kinds of opportunities, with ministries that are, some are struggling because they need people or they need extra people. For example, our finance ministry has had people come in every Monday morning to go through the offerings and, and put things on computer and all that. And many of these are, are older people and, there's, and some have died off and some have health issues. And by the summer, we're going to be down to almost nobody if you're someone who's got the time and, is willing and, and pays attention to details and is reliable with, with money, stop by the uh, finance portion of, out there. There's, there's a children's area, a student ministry area where the leaders there want to share with you the exciting things God's doing in those ministries, how you can help the guardians, those who help supervise us on this campus to make sure we're kept safe, the facilities, what we can do to help improve the look of the grounds inside and outside. We have outreach opportunities that the outreach team is looking to do outside the church. For example, uh, this Saturday, this coming Saturday, we have the opportunity to go down the street to Pinello Elementary between 9 and noon to do a service project to bless the teachers and to help with the, with the campus there, Pinello Elementary. I thought, oh, that's so easy. It's right down the road from us. I'm going. I'm going to be there. Some of our outreach team will be there. I want you to come. Be part of that with us if you've got time to do that. There's future projects coming. What I'm just saying to you is this. God is opening up doors to serve. And if you don't know what your gift is, step through some doors, start serving, and you're going to start finding things that resonate with you. And I'll tell you this. There's no greater joy in your life that you'll find than when, you, when God uses you to bless others. And that's, that's what happened to Jesus. You know why Jesus went to the cross? For the joy set before him. It was what the cross would accomplish. Jesus served to the point of laying his life down on a cross for you and me, not because that felt good, but because Jesus saw, if I do this, think of all the people this will bless. And you and I, he's not asking us to be crucified. He's just asking us, would you sacrifice some time? Would you sacrifice some energy? Would you sacrifice some attention so that you could have the joy set before you? See, all of us are doing one of two things. We're either making excuses or making a difference. Which is it for you?